and all participants from di different parts of Indonesia and the world who join us today on Zoom and our YouTube channel, PBI USD. We're very thrilled that the seats are fully booked. Today, we have participants from Aceh to Papua. We also have participants from around the world. Thank you very much for your enthusiasm. I'm truly Almendo Pasaribu from the English Language Education Study Program of Universitas Sanata Dharma. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome you all to virtual talk number seven. This series of talks are made possible because of the collaborations of Extensive Reading Foundation or ERF, Indonesian Extensive Reading Association, IERA, and of course, the English Language Education Study Program of Universitas Sanata Dharma Yogyakarta. Virtual Talk Chapter PBI USD will run every Saturday until the 25th of July, so please mark your calendar. Please also note that this month, the talks can be streamed on PBI USD YouTube channel, so don't forget to subscribe to our channel to get the notifications. The topics offered in this series will be very relevant and contextual as we, school teachers, are going to start the new academic year soon. And today, we are very honored as we are going to listen to the talks delivered by Cory Kobi MA, Irfan Rifai PhD, Made Harisentosa PhD, and Monica Ella Harendita MED, who are going to share some insights on the topic reading resources for school teachers. In addition to the main talks, we are also going to have another session with three panelists, Mahbudin MPD, Chris Asanti MED, and Mega Wulandari MHUM. Firman Parlindungan PhD of Universitas Teuku Umar and IERA will lead our discussion today as the moderator. Before we start the talks, please allow me to read the rules of this talk. If you're joining the talk on Zoom, please always remember to turn off both your microphone and camera during the session. For Zoom participants, please click on the raise hand icon if you want to address questions. You can also type the questions in the Zoom chat room or comment box on YouTube. We also have some panelists who are going to help answer the questions. At the end of the session, we are going to provide you with the link to the exit ticket via screen sharing. The link will also be posted in the Telegram, Zoom chat room, and YouTube comment box. You can then download the certificate. Please note that the link is available at the end of all presentations. And now, we are happy to have the Vice Rector 4 of Universitas Sanata Dharma, Dr. Oda Tedaena to officially open this virtual talk series. Bapak Oda, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, Bu Truli. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, this is, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, virtual talk number seven. So, last week we had uh, number six, and I was, I was um, attending also the, this talk, and I uh, uh, to be honest, actually, I'm I'm not a not a good reader, so that's why I I am interested in this uh, this program. So last week, uh, I learned that from uh, Pak Thomas Wahyu Prabowo Mukti and also the the headmaster from uh, I did not remember her name, but she was from uh, West Java, that the program is doable. So last week we had some examples of um, extensive reading program in in the school. And what I like about that is that um, there are lots of questions actually from uh, last week's talk. And uh, most of the questions are about uh, testing. That, that's what I read from the, from the chat and also from the YouTube. So do we need to test? I think um, from last week's talk, although that was already number seven, but I think there are still some confusion about um, intensive reading and extensive reading. So testing and what kind of test. So I think... Um, I'm not a good reader because of probably because of the experience when I was in school. So most of the time I have to read and, and I, will, I will be tested. So 
then I don't like reading because because of the test, you know. But I think extensive reading is 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 a kind of different way to to approach reading. So um, it is not to replace intensive reading in school, but I think it it you know extensive and in, intensive reading if they go together, like the example that uh, Pa Thomas and also the the school in in West Java. Um, brought i think that that is a, a kind of perfect example so those who those students so there are students who like tests but there are students who don't like tests like myself then you know we can combine those two this is not or but it's more and you know so we have the intensive program at school but also uh, we have the extensive program so that kids or students they will like um, reading i think that that is the um, you know the, the point that probably today will be um, underlining because um, I think the talk today is is more um, on the uh, school teachers, okay, resources for the school teachers. And also, I think this is very important. I, I was born in a village, grew up in a village, although my village is only like 12 kilometers from Jogja, but we don't really have good books uh, when I was in, in school. So I think providing uh, resources when the teachers they they try to to make it happen, providing resources, Hola. that is um, that is very good for you know for us and for the students. And hopefully, uh, students will like uh, reading. They will become good readers. You know, um, I think um, yeah, that that's reading. So for me, the the replacement was extensive listening i think I, I was i was into listening more than into reading because there were there were no um good books for example in, in my school so hopefully today um, i think the discussion will be around that so um, providing uh, resources for school how can we do that how can era help for example i think era has been working with um, many schools in indonesia and i think it's, it's growing and it's working very very well. We started in 2006, 2007. It's, it's growing, so I'm I'm very happy with the with the result that we initiated the um, reading uh, extensive reading foundation at that time, and then Sanata Dharma University. We worked together, and then we we uh, formed Iera, and then now it's it's growing. That that's really um, really good sign. So I think um, you will learn a lot. We will learn a lot from this this talk and. Um, so enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pa Oda. Okay, as everyone cannot wait to listen to the talks, let's start the talk soon. I leave the floor to Bapak Firman as our moderator. Pak Firman, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Bu Truly. And salam hormat to Pak Vice Rector, uh, Dr. Oda. Uh, it was a great talk. And hi everyone, it's good to see everyone here back at uh, Virtual Talk 7 with our main topic is reading resources for school teachers. And as already mentioned that we have four main speakers today and three panelists. And I would like to, rem uh, to remind everyone that we, have, we are going to have two sessions. And the first is presentations by the four main speakers and three panelists. And then the second session will be the questions and answers. So if you have questions or concerns while the speakers are still presenting, please use the chat tools in Zoom or comment box on YouTube channel. And the committee will select the questions later on. And uh, you may also be given a chance to speak uh, online. And for the first speaker today is uh, Mr. Corey Kobe MA. Uh, he will talk about choosing the best book format for ER, paper versus digital. And Corey Kobe holds a Bachelor of Arts in Law and a Master of Arts in English Language Teaching. And he has been teaching in Japan at the secondary and tertiary levels for the past 13 years. He is an Associate Professor of English at Tezukaya Magaokin University in Osaka and serve as a business manager for the Japan Association for Language Teachers, or GALT. He is actively involved in the extensive reading community as an educator, researcher, teacher, trainer, presenter, and executive board member of the Extensive Reading Foundation. 
and he has published nearly 30 articles related to English language teaching. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Corey Kobe. Okay, thank you very much. I think I, uh, okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, My I'm sorry, Kobe, uh, you have 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay. All right. I will uh, share my screen here and hopefully this is going to work. Let's see. Okay. So, all right. So hopefully you can see my uh, screen. Uh, okay. So my topic today is uh, choosing the best book format for extensive reading, paper versus digital. And there's a lot of debate uh, about this. Uh, amongst the extensive reading uh, community. So I'm going to try and bring a little bit of uh, data and a little bit of insight into my own experience in my uh, extensive reading program. Uh, one of the two extensive reading programs that I administer here in Japan. Um, and my little uh, message at the bottom is, I hope you like pie. And as I go through the presentation, you'll understand why I hope you like pie. So. Here we go. Um, okay, so um, I started my uh, uh, program that I'm going to talk with you today about um, at Miyagi Gakuin University, which is a women's university uh, in Northern Japan. And uh, this past year I moved to a new university, Tezuka Yama Gakuin. And I actually have extensive reading programs that I'm managing currently in both universities. So I travel back and forth between uh, the two different universities. And uh, as you heard in the uh, introduction there, my uh, affiliation is also with the Extensive Reading Foundation. I am a, uh, an executive board member with the ERF, and I'm also the, um, the conference chair for the next uh, Extensive Reading World Congress, which is going to be held in Indonesia. So we're very excited to be coming to Indonesia to bring you our next Extensive Reading World Congress. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, but uh, first of all, the program that I'm uh, going to talk with you about today and where I've collected this data that I'm going to share with you um, today. So it's uh, Miyagi Gakui Women's University, which um, is a mid-range university. We have about uh, 850 universities in Japan and it's ranked right about 350. 400 range. So it's not a high level university, it's not a low level university, um, and it's all women, which is a bit unusual in some parts of the world, but it's not uncommon here in Japan. And I'm very lucky that I'm teaching uh, in this program to uh, English majors. They're all English majors. So they're not non-majors, they're not uninterested in English, they've all self-selected English as their major in university. So for me, it's uh, very motivating uh, to teach keen students. And it's a small program. Um, these are the kinds of numbers that we're talking about here. Um, the uh, first four years of my uh, program, we had 67, 79, 91, and uh, 92. And then this current year, uh, we've got 85 students um, as the cohort, the intake uh, for each year. So not a lot of uh, students. So it gives us the opportunity to work closely with them. We divide these, uh, the cohorts into two or three uh, different divisions. So we have pretty small class sizes. We've got around 25, 30 students in a class. So it's very manageable, very reasonable to deal with, um, which is kind of a, a luxury, I think, um, in uh, the university uh, world. So the program that I designed um, starting in 2016 um, is based around reading volume. Uh, for the beginning, that's the main thing that we do. So this is the chart that we use for our reading volume. Uh, we use 70% uh, of our assessment in this course strictly based on the amount of numbers that the students read. So you'll see that the lowest amount that the students uh, are expected to read or in order to pass the course they must read is uh, anywhere from 90 to 180,000 words per semester depending on which of the four semesters they're in. It's a two-year program. So by the end, they're expected to read at least 540,000 words, which is a fairly tall task, but it is a standalone extensive reading uh, program. It's not combined with 
uh, any other uh, skills. This is uh, strictly extensive reading. So I'm happy to report that over one third of the students uh, each year uh, achieve in their first year alone, in their first year alone, over one third of the students read over one million words. So they're very motivated. And it's a very, uh, for me, a very good place to be teaching. So how we manage all of this reading, um, we use a combination of paper books and ebooks. And we use, uh, we manage all of the reading through a portal called X Reading, which many of you may be uh, familiar with. So, X Reading, um, it uh, is a paid for platform, but for my course, it's my textbook. The students don't need to buy any other textbook, they don't need to buy any other resources, they only pay for their uh, annual access to X Reading. This gives them access to about a thousand digital books and uh, over 6,000 quizzes for paper books. And uh, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Oda just a minute ago talking about testing or no testing or what kind of testing. So all of the books that my students read, they must do a short comprehension quiz. And they're very easy, very short, um, but just to verify that they've actually done the reading. And as I said, that's all managed through X reading. It's not very expensive. I think uh, in Japan, it's quite a bit more than in Indonesia. Our students pay about 30 US dollars a year. And I think in Indonesia, it's around 13 or 14 US dollars a year. So it's actually a lot cheaper for you guys. So I started out um, looking, when I started my program, I was looking at uh, paper books versus eBooks. And it seemed to me that overall, uh, these are my three different uh, divisions that I had that year. Um, and in the first semester, the students seemed to be reading more paper books than eBooks. And I thought I, you know, I was curious to see because I had heard a lot of debate and I really didn't know um, which were better. I know what I prefer, but I didn't want to tell the students what they should be preferring. So they have the choice for both. In the second semester, they seem to migrate a lot more towards the paper books and away from the ebooks. And this is strictly the number of books, not the number of words. So um, one class read about 1500, one class read over 2000 books, and the other class uh, read around uh, 1200 books. Um, so it wasn't really promising, but there were issues with X reading, there were issues with the digital books that year. So I didn't really think this was a, a valid uh, way of um, kind of assessing the interest in ebooks or the amount of like or dislike towards ebooks. So I kept looking uh, and I looked um, the, so this is the, the first cohort. So 2016, um, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, about 30% um, who were reading ebooks, uh, about 30% of the books chosen were ebooks. And then it dropped down to under 20%. Um, it was about 15, 18% in the second semester. But in the third semester, it went back up to almost the same as first semester. And then it increased even more in fourth semester. And I thought maybe that semester two is a bit of an anomaly. Maybe it was because of the platform, the books being a little bit difficult to access, but I wasn't really sure. So I kept collecting data. The next year started out uh, that the students, uh, the, for these are first year students, in their first semester, they were reading not so much. Um, they were reading um, approximately 12% uh, ebooks. But in the second semester, they increased and they were reading quite a bit more. That jumped up more than double to 27%. And I thought, oh, maybe the students are getting more comfortable. Maybe they're getting more familiar and they're reading more. So I kept collecting data in the third semester, which would be the first semester of 2018, and it jumped up a lot, up to 38%. And in their final semester, the students actually ended up reading 47% ebooks. So almost half and half. So as the students became familiar with the platform and as the students became familiar with how to navigate through the books, and they became, uh, I guess, accustomed to the uh, access online, they seem to migrate more and more towards uh, eBooks. And I thought this was a really interesting trend. So I continued to collect data the next year. And 
I've been really looking at the 2018 cohort for a number of different reasons. I've got a great deal of data. And if it wasn't for COVID, I would have had an absolutely perfect two-year snapshot of a pre-TOIC, a midway TOIC, and an end TOIC test for the entire two years. But unfortunately, in April of this year, the students didn't come to school on campus, so we didn't do the TOIC. So this was going to be my, my major uh, ER study that I was going to publish, but it's on a bit of a, a, a sidetrack at the moment. So again, students for this cohort started out with uh, reading about 32% eBooks. And by this time, the X reading platform was running really smoothly. So the choice between eBooks and paper books really wasn't one of uh, a platform issue. It was strictly, I, I felt it was strictly a matter of um, likes and dislikes at this point. So what happened after that, why am I not advancing? Oh, my PowerPoint has plucked. Hang on. Let me restart it. Just give me a moment. Let me just restart it. Okay. Here it comes. Okay, and share my screen. Whew. Okay, I think we're back. <laughs> okay, so as I said, the students uh, were increasing uh, semester by semester. What we had was, uh, hang on. Okay, here. Okay, so 2018, what we had was the students started out with only 12% ebooks. In the second semester, they increased to 27%. And third semester, it went up to 38%. And the fourth semester, 47 uh, uh Sorry, the, the fourth semester was 67% uh, ebooks. So the ebooks seem to have increased considerably as the students uh, became more uh, fluent readers. So I haven't done research into exactly why in detail, but I did do end of, uh, end of semester interviews with the students. And it seemed that the students, as I suspected, were becoming more and more comfortable with the eBooks. They found them more convenient. Many of them found them more convenient. And uh, so they were accessing them. They could get them 24 hours a day. So they were using them a lot more than at the beginning. So the eBooks seem to have been very valuable. The next cohort, that I um, am managing. The 2019, the same sort of trends are showing in the second semester of the four semester program, the first year students already read more than half digitally. So there seems to be quite an interest in eBooks, um, but, but I thought I would look at individual students and I thought, let's look and see at the top readers, the bottom readers, let's see if there are some trends. So I looked at my top reader, my number one reader in the entire cohort, and she did not read all that many, uh, all that many paper uh, ebooks, only 17%. So I thought, oh, wow, okay, this is interesting. I wonder if perhaps the stronger readers read uh, 
paper books and maybe the weaker readers rely on digital books. So that I had a look at the bottom reader and, oh, okay. So the bottom reader was reading 35% eBooks in the first year. I thought, well, this is an interesting trend. I wonder how it pans out over the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the cohort. Unfortunately, the second most voluminous reader in the entire cohort read way more digital books than the student that's above her. So there was no consistency. And I thought, oh, well, this is a little weird. And student number 90 read even more eBooks, even more. She read 64% eBooks. So I thought this is really inconsistent. Oh, and my PowerPoint is parking again. All right. The bottom line is, and I'll just talk while the PowerPoint is coming back up. The bottom line is that um, what I found through researching um, the actual individual cases in my data set is that there is no consistency between the different, uh, between the top readers and bottom readers. It's very, very much an individual choice. Uh, there, so here are, uh, no. Uh, I'm sorry, Kobe, you have four more minutes. Yeah, I'm just about done. Okay. Okay, so, all right, so these are my numbers. Basically, the top readers were all over the map, the bottom readers were all over the map, and all of the readers were all over the map. The students don't have any particular pattern. Each individual is different, and individual choice is very important. So my point is that individual choice is the key to choosing the right format. Having choices makes us feel powerful. More choice leads to better choices, and what many of you may be familiar with, here's a quotation I'd like to share. Learners choose what they want to read. And this is a Dan Bamford quote that's uh, almost 20 years old now. 18 years ago, Dan Bamford gave us the top 10 principles of extensive reading. And this was principle number three, giving the students choice. So my main point between digital and paper books and which format is, is best? Both are best. If you're in a position to be able to provide paper and digital books to your students, please do that because each student has a preference and there's no consistency between individuals. Some like paper, some like digital, and some like both. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, suffering through all of my pie charts. And just to mention to you, the sixth World Congress on Extensive Reading is in Yogyakarta, August 9th through 12th next summer. So please join us there for a couple of hundred different presentations, all focused on extensive reading and extensive listening. Thank you very that much. That was wonderful, Kobe. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a high, highlight, yeah? Uh, <laughs> looking at how ebook reading increase every year and how the difference between top and bottom readers in every cohort. And Kobe, I'm looking forward to read the published article of your research. And you ladies and gentlemen, please let us move to the second speaker, uh, Bapak Irfan Rifai, PhD, with the themes talking your classroom with reading materials, a few things to consider. And Pak Irfan had taught different levels of schools and students, elementary to secondary, before securing a faculty member position at Venus University's English department in 2008. Since then, Pak Irfan has been given the responsibility to teach mostly reading, writing, and EFL pedagogy courses. His interest on reading and literacy began as he was observing the reading and literacy development of his first job which eventually brought him to take doctoral degree in reading and literacy from the Ohio State University. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pak Irfan Rifai. Uh, Pak Irfan, you have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. That's yours. Okay, thank you Pak Firman for the very nice introduction. Okay, uh, we'll share my screen now. Hopefully it's, it's gonna work okay. All right. 
Okay, so um, ladies and, ge and gentlemen, my name is uh, Irfan Rifai. I'm, I'm from Indus University. So um, today I will be uh, sharing a little bit on uh, reading resources. But before I start, I'm, I'm going to take you back to um, last week, yeah? So last week we had this um, uh, virtual talk and we focused on extensive reading implementation for school level. And um, I did notice that uh, some of the speakers also mentioned about reading resources. And I, I couldn't help but screen shooting their presentations because I found that what they shared last week are gonna be very relevant to what I'm going to share today, yeah? So, um, so the first thing that I, I found interesting was um, uh, this slide by Dr. Rob when he uh, shared about finding suitable materials. And then uh, with the two conditions of budget and no budget, yeah, he suggested that, you know, if you don't have any budgets, go to the internet, but please use very careful eyes because you cannot, you know, you are not very, you can never be sure of what you're gonna find on the internet, yeah? And also with the money available, let's say you don't have any problems or issues with the money, then you need to deal with other things as well. You need to consider some, some of the things. Like for example, the levels of the students and whether or not your materials would be interesting. Okay, so you know that is the first thing about uh, Dr. Rob's presentation. The second thing that I noticed as well was uh, when he um, talked about uh, how we could get books, he suggested a very valuable suggestion. Yeah, so I, I noticed that he mentioned that we should involve our partners. So as teachers, we should involve students as our partners to provide books, you know, not only for us, but for them. We should also, you know, involve schools, in this case, school administrations, talk to them, and then also the parents. So as teachers, you cannot but working together collaboratively uh, with these uh, stakeholders of yours, yeah? Work with students, work with parents, work with school administrators if you wanna provide books. That's why I, I totally agree with Pat or Dr. Rob said uh, on, this, um, uh, on his suggestion. He also kindly shared with us some very uh, uh, usable and reliable links for our context to study English, yeah? Or the books that provide uh, good uh, teaching of English for our schools or students. Now, if you wanna go back and return to last week's presentation, you can always uh, go to the uh, PBI USC or English Language Education Sanata Dharma University YouTube account. You can, you can play and replay what, what, has been, uh, 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 what has been done previously. Okay, the second uh, thing is a speaker uh, or Pat Thomas who had share with us at least from what I noticed three very important points. The first one, Pat Thomas suggested that we, you know, shouldn't rely on graded readers. If we cannot find it, then it, it doesn't have to be graded readers. But one thing we should bear in mind is this, yeah? The level of the students. We should know the levels of the student and we should adjust uh, uh, the books, our book selections with, with the student's ability. Okay, that's the first point from Pat Thomas. The second point that he also um, uh, pointed out is to always prepare easy materials. You know, many times I've heard our expect, uh, extensive reading expert mention about start small, start uh, with easy reading materials. Start, if you wanna start extensive reading program at your school, start with small um, initiatives and then always start with easy materials. I cannot agree more with Pat Thomas on this case. I believe the like of Pat Willy, Bu Ivan, Bu Mita, Bu Anik, and uh, Bu Fenty and other previous speakers have, always, have also notified this and mentions that we should always provide easy materials because again, the proficiency level students will determine their sense of accomplishment in this case. Okay, and the third thing that I noted about Pat Thomas presentation was this. Yeah, to give freedom to students and believe in their selections of the, the materials outside of the school. Yeah, it gives them a sense of control. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my topic today is, is something to do with control. Yeah, so students will, you know, we believe students will have, you know, we give them freedom. Go and find the, the books that you like. But then in the case of the, the school, in the context of the school, 
there are things that we can do to provide this sense of freedom to schools. So that is going to be the topic of my um, discussion today or the topic of my sharing. So uh, I entitled the, the topic of my sharing as talking your classroom with reading materials, a few things to consider. I love the word stalking because it gives like a sense of that you don't have any uh, budget issue in, in, you know, in, in providing your students with, with reliable books. But let's say that we don't have the, the, the budget problem, Bapak Ibu, because uh, Pak Rob had, you know, had shared with us very important link as well as Pak uh, Kobe earlier, yeah? So um, I will start with this though. Uh, you know, the, the questions of uh, providing uh, reliable reading materials for students brought me back to my experience or my, the memory of doing a research in a United States schools in 2017, in which I was working with a language arts teacher in a private uni, uh, in the private school there in the Midwest of, of the United States. And then I, I recall my one year interactions more or less in which I, I was in touch with, with her through emails. I discussed things with her on the teaching, on learning, on their student's life, on her life, on her journey, on, on her identity construction as the second generations of America, as well as the text and how texts are being integrated in the classroom. Yeah, so based on you know, some of the questions that I, that I asked her, because I, I was kind of curious on how she actually stuck her classroom with variety of books. So this is the question I asked her. How did you select the books? What were your consideration in selecting the books for your class? You know, these questions led to more uh, questions. So I asked her more and more questions on, on the selections of the book, but I'm not gonna explore this today. What I'm going to explore to you, uh, Bapak Ibu, is these three questions, yeah? So, uh, or statements, yeah? So I'm, I'm going to suggest that when we provide or when we try to stock books in our classroom, please consider these three points. First, let's us balance our materials with variety of informational and literary texts, variety of genres, and variety of locally and globally produced materials. Yeah, and number two, let us also consider the difficulty and the complexity level of the books that we are going to stock in the classroom. And lastly, let us consider the representation of, of the different cultures that these books are going to expose our students with. Okay, let us um, uh, um, see this from the, the philosophical view first. Let's, let's try to answer the why question of why we should vary our reading materials. Is it because the, curr the curriculum said that we should? Well, perhaps. But then um, this is one thing that we need to bear in mind. Your students, ladies and gentlemen, might have different interests or reading references. Probably not might. Probably they do have different interests or, or, or reading preferences. I read this article by uh, Jacobson and uh, Pat Wheely, uh, the, the article that they wrote in 2015. So when you provide uh, various reading materials in your classroom or in the, the school library for your students, it, it means that you provide them the opportunity to read or to select those materials which interest them. Yeah, and then by then, by doing that, you are focusing, you know, your teaching and learning are focusing on the students, not on you. Okay, then the second point is this. It was, you know, written in 2000, 20 years ago. I cannot believe that we refer to the, the year 2000 as 20 years ago myself. But then, so International Reading Association already stated that children have the right to access a wide variety of books. So if we don't provide this to the students, to our kids, we are not giving them their probably God-given right, okay? And then that's number two. Um, I would like to talk about curriculum, but let, let's, uh, let's keep it for later, okay? Or let's just jump into number four. Now, the, you know, why do we need to vary our reading materials? Research or studies found that not only good quality text, but also the breadth, you know, the, the wide variety of text will support the student's ability to comprehend text. Yeah, so when you do that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bapak Ibu, 
you will support your students' ability to comprehend text. Okay, just by providing them. Yeah. Yeah. Also, number five. Uh, sorry, I'm being muted. Okay. So I attended this um, a webinar by Dr. Krashen uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, oh, sorry, two weeks ago, and then he mentioned about the importance of input to be comprehensible. Let's say that input in this case is, is uh, reading materials. The need, to, the, the need of input to be comprehensible, yeah, in this case, students' ability, compelling, interest, abundant and rich, wide variety of books. Yeah? So, okay, by, by doing this, you will help students' uh, acquisition of, of the language they are learning. Now, let's go back to the curriculum uh, point. I, at least I found that two curriculums were you know, mandating the you know, mandating us to have two, uh, to, uh, mandating us to have variety of texts, yeah? The, the first one was, you know, the United States um, uh, curriculum, who, which, said, which stated that um, elementary students at this level should have balanced, complex, literary, and informational texts in the classroom, yeah? So it's mandated in their curriculum. What about in Indonesia? In Indonesia, this is what we have. Yeah, we have the guidance of Gerakan Literasi Sekolah, or in English, we call it uh, School Literacy Movement. On page 37, they, they clearly state that students should choose additional fictions and non-fictions. It's not either, it's, it's both fiction and non-fictions in order for what? To engage students, that's the purpose. To train students to think critically. Number three, to appreciate work of literature and to make them, number four, able to write in such a genre. So what I like about this is it's not only that it is focusing on the input, it also focuses on the output, yeah? The process is the student's reading and the output is for them to be able to read in the, in the style or, or the genre that they've been exposed to. Okay, now let's go back to the third uh, points that I mentioned earlier. Number one, we should vary our reading materials with both informational and literary texts. What are literary texts? You know them already. They are drama, they are poetry, they are kinds of fictions, they are folk tales, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I'm giving two examples here. What about informational texts? Uh, well, you know them already as well, right? So you, you know, newspapers, anything written that, that you know, presents data, autobiographies, scientific reports, and DIY books, et cetera. And also, uh, please bear in mind that we provide these both information and, and literary text because your students are coming from different families and every family has their own preferences of reading. They has their own funds of knowledge, has their own habits. Some students are aspired to be astronauts. Some students are aspired to be teachers. Some students are as, you know, aspire to be doctors. So by providing this wide variety of selections, students will be able to find their mirrors, to find their, uh, their own reflections there, okay? And they're, they're, what interests them uh, to read as well. What about how do we select them? How do we select informational texts um, uh, for our students? I found this very interesting uh, checklist provided by Reading Rockets. So if you wanna go to Reading Rockets, it's a very resourceful um, website that provides a lot of uh, reading tips and books, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So, so at least they they um, pointed out five points that if you know uh, that you need to consider if you wanna um, find or select informational books. Okay, ask yourself this question on the cover: Is it attractive for the students? Number two, uh, is it interesting for the student as well? The content is okay. Is it age appropriate? Also, when you talk about the illustrations, are the illustrations or photographies inviting enough for the students? Uh, do the photographies or the illustrations support or not support the, the text? Also, consider the organization of this, the, the, the content of the book. Uh, does it have table of contents, index, and glossary? Do, do they have divided section and stuff? And also, bear in mind the font size and the type of the size of the, the informational text. That is how we you know, there's just uh, some suggestions on how we select informational text. This is how we select literary text. I'm, I'm giving you an example 
of a, a very recent study by Moorhouse. So she conducted this study with, with a group of pre-service uh, students. So she created a bookmark and asked her pre-service students to think of these six points of, of discussion be, as they were reading a book. So the first question would be, what learners would this book be suitable for? Consider the age, consider their language level, consider their interest as well. Okay, number two, what knowledge or skills might learners need to make meaning from the book? So it's the questions of their background knowledge. So I think this, that's why it is very important for us to know uh, the background knowledge of our students. What do they know already, you know, in order for, for them to be able, or in order for them to engage with the, the books that you are going to offer them. Number three, how might, how might you scaffold or support learners to read the book for meaning? It's the scaffolding or the pedagogical uh, issues. How are you going to use the books that you are reading now to teach in the classroom? Okay, and number four, uh, because most of us, I believe, I assume are language teachers. So we can start to think of the, the language learning opportunities that we can use or we can maximize from the book we are reading now. Number five, and then we should ask questions of other learning opportunities, yeah? So the students will get uh, uh, more benefits uh, or anything that you can actually expand from, from reading the book. And lastly, can you find any online resources to help you utilize this book? Now, in my case, this is what I do. To answer this, no, uh, the questions number six, I follow Udotopia and, and, and their Twitter and their, and, and their, on their website. I, I, you know, I, I read what they share, the reviews of the books, as well as international literacy associations of the books recommendation and other stuff, and also I, I follow Common Sense Media. They, they have this recommendation of books to read or, or the, age, uh, um, um, the age advice at the age level of students that, that can read this. And of course, lastly, go to the Extensive Reading Foundation uh, blog. Yeah? There you can find a lot of recommendation as well as some free books. Okay, so that's how we select literary text selection. This is just one of the recommendation. Now, uh, but sorry, have, have we varied the genre too? I'm sorry, Pai Irfan, three minutes more. Okay, so have we varied the genre? This is just an example of, of genre. Yeah, if you go to oprahmagazine.com and then uh, on their uh, suggestions of books, you can find that there are 20, yes, 21 genre of books. So, you know, you have a rich opportunity to actually enrich the selections of your books. So if you, if you like students' book, these children book, these are children books. Some of them are really my favorite, the very hungry caterpillar, we are going on a bear hunt, uh, all the places you will go, Dr. Seuss is always amazing. Okay, but let's, let's move on. So the, the second thing that you can consider, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the difficulty level or complexity of the text. Yeah, so it's easy because some of the books, if they are graded, they will have this, they will have, uh, the graded reader scale. So you just have to follow them. So it's, it's easy, it has been done by other people for you. But, but what happens if they don't? This is what you can do. A, a qualitative measure, this one is uh, recommended by Fisher and friends, yeah? So ask these questions. Does the book have multiple levels of meaning and ambiguity? The more ambiguous the meaning, the more complex it is. The more it is in fighting for students to discuss. So I remember that once Bumita mentioned uh, when he, when she was quoting uh, Butruli about dialogic reading, yeah, or something like that. So I think, so I think in this case, well, literary text will provide uh, more opportunities for students to discuss things. Okay, and then pay attention to the genre as well. Yeah, so sorry for the structure. Is it uh, does it have a lot of flashback or shifting perspectives? Does it have uh, multiple styles of English, and also does it require strong relevance or prior knowledge? Yeah. This is also one thing that we need to consider. Now, this is the last thing that I would like to point out. Uh, a professor in children literature that uh, goes by the name of Bishop, she advised that in our selections of books, especially children liter literature book, we should consider books as, you know, uh, as mirrors, as well as windows as, and sliding glass doors. Why is it a mirror? students need to see that there is a reflection 
of their identity in the books that they are reading. Students at the same time need to see as well to uh, other cultures in order to be able to understand other people. Now, the thing is with the majority of the people, they, on, they often find mirrors in the books, but they don't find a lot of uh, windows. They don't get to see other people's cultures or how other cultures are viewing things. So also books can also be sliding glass doors in which it is the opportunity for the readers to inhabit characters' lives and experience. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just move on with this. Now, as- uh, Sorry, Pak Irfan, maybe you can wrap up the presentation. Okay, I'll, I'm going to wrap up in one minute. Okay, when this kid read, yeah, can he make connections to at least these three points? The, uh, does, can he make connection to his lived experience? Can he make connections to other books or the texts that he had read in the past? Or can he make connections to what is happening to the world? Provide them. It is COVID-19, so find me. Probably it, it, it's wise to provide them more information on, on the COVID-19 because it's really is going to engage them through reading. Now I'm going to end uh, my session today with this. Yeah, this is uh, taken from uh, one of Dr. Seuss books. And will you succeed, ladies and gentlemen, Bapak Ibu, uh, dear teachers? Yes, you will, indeed. 98 and 3 4 percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. But let's change kids with this because we need motivation as well to do this. Teachers will move mountains. Thank you so much, Pak Irfan. That will be all. Thank you so much, Pak Irfan. That was a wrap. Uh, talking about suggestions on choosing reading materials in the classroom, start from control to variations of some books and materials to, to be in the classroom. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Maji Heri Santosa, PhD. We will talk about reading resources and stories from rural areas in Bali. And Maji Heri Santosa is a lecturer at Universitas Pendidikan Ganesa, Bali, Indonesia. He publishes and reviews works on EFL, CALL, e-learning literacy, innovative pedagogies, learning technologies, learner anatomy, and learning approaches. And he has been extensively speaking in various TESOL forums and workshops for Indonesian teachers and headmasters. He is currently working on several projects, including character and local wisdom-based children's stories. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Made Hari Santosa, PhD. Thank you very much, Pak Firman. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, Pak Oda and Pak Irfan, Corey also, and all the members from AIRA, and also Ibu Bapak. Allow me to sc screen share my PowerPoint first. Can you see this, Pak Firman? Yes, very clear. Thank you. So Ibu Bapa, good afternoon. Uh, I am trying to share with you and basically some stories uh, about what I'm doing in terms of helping uh, disadvantaged uh, kids and schools in rural areas in Bali. So this is probably more of best practices. Uh, I will share my stories with lots of photos, of course with permissions, and I do hope that you can learn something from what I share. My name is Madeheri Santosa. I'm from Universitas Pendidikan Ganesha in Singaraja, Bali. Uh, when I first came back to from my study and also from my travels, when I uh, presented in conferences, I normally went into schools and observed some things there, especially in the classrooms. And when I got back, I tried to reflect to myself. So <clears throat> that's why I came up into this uh, project of myself. Uh, before this, I already uh, do other things also. And uh, today I will focus on one of the projects called Bali Edukasi. This is a social uh, NGO project, uh, basically run by myself uh, with some other volunteers. So today I'm going to share with you why I'm working on Bali rural areas and how do I uh, do the project and uh, what to do in the project and what can I do in the future? Why I do or take education uh, as the area that I focus on. If you heard the name Bali, 
uh, Ibu Bapak, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that you can immediately, you know, nod your head. Oh, Bali. And that's why I also feel easier to introduce uh, me, uh, myself, if I am from Bali, Bali rather than from Indonesia, because I don't need to explain more uh, about where is Indonesia located and so on. But then uh, I'm sure also you know that Bali will, is very famous, one of the best tourist destinations in the world. If you go to Bali, you, you will imagine beaches, uh, many other things and so on. Right, this is, uh, this is Kalinking Beach. So the idea is that it's uh, in the shape of your pinky toe, uh, pinky, uh, and that's why it is called that, that, that name. It's located in one of the separated small island uh, in Bali called Nusa Penida. So, and then <clears throat> the thing is that uh, if you know Bali is very famous for that, you see glamorous side, you also go to Kuta Beach, for example, there are so many, let's say luxurious thing happening there. Uh, but then uh, my, from my personal perspective, or whenever I travel uh, from different perspectives from the US, from Europe, from Australia, Asia, and also uh, listening stories from my friends from uh, Africa, for example, I can compare what happens especially in terms of education. Uh, as a Balinese myself, every time I uh, escort my friend, so when I, whenever my friend go to Bali, they will, okay, Harry, uh, try, to, uh, where should I go? They think that I know a lot of places in Bali as a Balinese, in fact, I don't. Uh, but then when I had time to escort them, what I saw normally in tourism areas is that I saw Balinese people but most of them are working in a low level, uh, let's say uh, type of jobs, for example, as a driver, as a guide and so on. So in terms of human resources, I, I was thinking that why us cannot you know, uh, achieve better, uh, like we, we, we work in a better position, let's say like that. Uh, is it about our human resources and so on and so on. Uh, from my PhD, also, also I work a lot about uh, cultures in Asian learning context and also the approaches of our students, which is more learning for grades and for scores rather than for comprehension. And uh, following what government said, uh, I try to, uh, you know, uh, practice and put things into more, more concrete uh, movement in terms of literacy. So. If you know that Bali is very famous, uh, very luxurious, uh, beaches, uh, hotel rooms, Ubud and so on. But then if you go to some places in Bali, in rural areas, there will be a school, for example, like this. This school is located in South Bali called Gianyar, which is the center of tourist area. So this is where we went uh, one of the time. So, our education is also more into uh, forcing our students into a particular standard rather than you know, providing them, them with uh, imagination and creativity and freedom to be themselves. So what I do then, uh, so I did try to de uh, design several programs. Uh, one of the programs called Pelangi. Pelangi in, is, uh, in English means rainbow. So I try to play around with acronyms. So Pelangi stands for Polita Harapan Negeri in Indonesia. So uh, it means that you, you try to you enlighten something uh, for the country. So this is a, a one day activity to schools and orphanages basically has reading and fun learning activity. And at the end of the day, uh, we ask all of the students and teachers to gather in, in a big hall or in the field of the school and then to summarize what we had done uh, the whole day. So we normally start very early in the morning and then we finish like uh, in, the, in the afternoon. So it's one day activity. Uh, we started very uh, small places before, very uh, not so many places up to a lot of places. This is the island of Bali, a small uh, island, 
but very famous according to some. And the picture that you saw just, uh, before, Clinking Beach, is located here in a separated island like this. So until after two years, we can reach all uh, major parts of Bali. So we did it voluntarily and basically uh, helping them to read a lot and also with fun and having a lot of games with, with students. And uh, we started with the first school located in North Bali. It's, a, it's an inclusive elementary school, uh, one of the inclusive elementary schools in Asia. Why it is inclusive? Because this school has deaf students and mixed together with hearing students. I know this village because I conducted my master's degree uh, research here on language acquisition of uh, hearing kid uh, born with deaf parents. So uh, she was the only hearing kid uh, living together with grandfather, grandmother, parents, all deaf. And then I was looking for how the kid acquired the language from very early age. So when I came back from my study, then I visited the, the school again, and then I tried to, to offer help. So basically we did a lot of reading activities. Many volunteers joined, uh, normally young people from all around Bali, my students. There are some also from uh, health sectors, from different fields of education. So we normally share stories uh, on moral values and characters and in English. And because there are some students who are deaf, we need uh, an assist from a teacher who can sign. The problem is with this situation, uh, with this location is that uh, the deaf people there uh, was not, uh, is not signing with American sign or British sign language. So it's, they are using context space. When I did my research there, I, I could sign. Yeah, for example, uh, telling cow like this and then uh, cutting the grass like this. But some other symbols are very different. Like if you touch your lips, it means 100,000 rupees, for example, like this. And then asking, do you have 1,000 rupees, 1,100 rupees for me and so on. Like this, it means, do you work? Yeah, so things like that. So it's very interesting and a lot of researchers already uh, coming to this place to do research. The name of the place is called Bengkala. It's very famous. Right. Uh, other than that, we keep continuing our journey. We went to several places in, in Bali rural areas. Sometimes we have to teach for in, in the village like this, in the, in the uh, you know, village hall. Yeah, we gather everything and then uh, not in the school. But some also we go, we went to schools and teaching them. So basically we help the teachers. Uh, with uh, supplementary things. So we learn from the syllabus and then we try to help the teachers, especially in English, because in elementary school in uh, Bali, especially in, in Indonesia, as we know, uh, we have lacks of uh, English resource, uh, human resources. Right, so basically these are the uh, things that we are doing. So a lot of uh, things we have traveled all around Bali, basically, and Another project that we do is also a more regular project, uh, normally consisting of six month program. So the one that I said just now is the one, one once off activity and this one is a regular one. So there are three main programs that we had uh, been doing. We had been doing on this six month program. The first one is called Gemasani, is focusing on reading. So helping the students to read and to have the you know affinity into readers to, to like reading. The second one is the second one is focusing on reading still, but more into helping them to be not only um, good in terms of their scores, but also in terms of their characters. And the third one is focusing on literacy as a whole and also in characters. So these three programs are basically uh, conducted by different volunteers. So every time new volunteers coming, I try to design a project with them and then they come up with their ideas and then we design our programs. For the first, so with Gamasani, we, what we did is we have a lot of reading activities with them 
And every time we went there, we asked them to read a book. Sometimes the school doesn't have a library. With this picture that I showed you, it has a library, but the books are not uh, arranged very well. So the first time we went there, we helped the, with, together with the kids, we uh, arranged the books first. And then we selected some books with them, and then the kids will report what they read in logbook. So we didn't decide how many, how much minutes that they have uh, read, but basically we want some uh, some changes from them. So for example, if they haven't read before, uh, the next week that we went there, they have to show us how 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 much how minutes they, they have read. And then what they read, they have to, when we went there, we will design several activities from games, from uh, performance and, and, and others. And then what they read, they have to put into what we call literacy tree. Okay. Then this is, these are some of the activities. So basically we just help. We, we didn't change a lot with the school system. We just assist and help. If the school has library, we help with the, with the library. If the kids wants to read a particular book, we sometimes bring them some books also from our home. And then these are some of the examples of the literacy tree that they had uh, done before. Another program is called Pandas Budi, which is uh, focusing on uh, characters also, and also helping them to grow uh, along in the school. So again, it's more integrated. So it is not only reading, but reading plus. So sometimes they started with readings and then they have to end with the performance project or other projects. So sometimes we went there and then asking them to read together with us. Sometimes they read by themselves. What is interesting with this project is that uh, one school that we visited in Tabanan Regency is near uh, a mountain there and it's the, the, the location is not easy to, to get. So we went there every month uh, with uh, my volunteers from all around Bali, and then we met in that place. So this school doesn't have any library. What we, what we did that time is we, we, were, we were helped by two other uh, communities, NGOs that time. Uh, one is painting communities and the other is, uh, uh, you know, um, book community, donation book, yeah, book donation. And then together we painted the school with the kids. The kids also helped us and everything is voluntary uh, up until we have a, what we call a literacy park, let's say like that. So where they can uh, spend their time to read the books that we donated. So this school doesn't have uh, or didn't have any library also at that time. And most of the schools in Bali, especially, I think in Indonesia too. So when we already had the book, we helped them with reading activities, uh, also listening and also having games. After they do, we ask them to do some activities like uh, arranging materials, uh, cutting and pasting and so on and so on. What is interesting from this picture on the uh, bottom left corner is that Every time we teach, some kids who are not from that school, sometimes they wanted to see, they, they picked. And it touched our feeling actually, how the, the other kids uh, also wanted to join. But because sometimes we are limited with human resources, we couldn't reach all of the kids' surroundings. And they, in the end, can produce some projects like this. Another project that we just finished this year uh, from last year actually is called Polita Karsa, basically similar, focusing on literacy, but on the intention to be a better person. So this is looking uh, a, broader, a broader theme, not only reading and literacy, but how to become a rounded person. And I believe that we have to start from the beginning, from early age. So basically we try to implement a more robust and a clearer procedure. One of the procedures that we took is called Design for Change. So DFC, it consists of four main stages, feel, imagine, do, and share. 
what we what we did with the schools is that it's still uh, also in uh, within six months and then we asked them and together with them uh, to do the steps the first one is with Phil we asked them to look for their surroundings for their canteen for the toilet for example for the schools uh, or classes and so on and then try to identify issues and then they decided into issues with the groups and then with imagine together with the mentor yeah, because the volunteer is becomes the mentor for them. Uh, they imagine, they brainstorm possible solutions. They pointed out possible solutions, and at the end, they decided which solution that they can do, which which is uh, feasible to be done. With the do, then they act on the plans. With the share, then we also help them to public share. Uh, normally, in our YouTube channel. Uh, we also got invited by uh, TV, local TV, uh, and also radio. Uh, Basically, Mike, I'm sorry, if you could wrap up the presentation yeah. in one minute, that would be great. Thank you. Basically, this is a, a, a together, a, a collaborative work together with teachers, parents, students, and mentors. So. What we did is basically this. So all of them are basically in, in stages. And then we also do a lot of uh, workshops on creative writing because we aim into a project-based learning type of thing and looking at uh, mixed conditions of the students as pa Irfan just now mentioned. And also we aim at not only the score side, but also the inner side as characters, uh, so we can help them to, you know, be a better person. Basically, we also uh, got a lot of donations, and we employ some technological tools. Like because I also have another project uh, developing Android application on virtual reality, I also try to employ that into the school. So. We have also a lot of other things. The last thing that we do now because of COVID is we publish books because we cannot expect others to donate all the time. And sometimes also the donation uh, that come, uh, let's say not all are, are needed or good. So we decided to develop our own book. One of the published one is called Scabby Dog already. So basically the idea is on helping the kids to be better. So these are our journey already, and uh, we believe in this, uh, you know, benefit of uh, education and then uh, investing good things for our young uh, generations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pak Madi. That was a very nice uh, experience from Bali. And next to the, Fourth speaker here is Ibu Monica Ella Herendita, MED. He, she will talk about reading resources for remote teaching. And Ibu Monica got her master's from Monash University on an Australia Award Scholarship in 2013. And shortly after that, she joined the teaching language education, the English language education of Universitas Sanata Dharma, where she teach a variety of courses like sociolinguistics, pronunciation, practice, and critical reading and writing. For her, reading is the most affordable and enjoyable form of time travel. And last year, she received an Australia Award Scholarship to pursue her PhD in the University of Western Australia. However, the departure has to be postponed due to the pandemic. Hopefully, she can depart soon. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ibu Monica Ella Herendita. Ibu, your time is about 15 minutes, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Firman. Let me try to share my screen. Okay, I hope it's perfectly shown. Wait, but I need to start from the very first slide. Okay, well, actually, my mind is still blown away by the previous presentations. They were all fascinating. So um, my name is Monica Ella Harendita, and I am a faculty member at the English Language Education of study, uh, study Program of Universitas Sanata Dharma. And um, my title of today's talk is Reading Resources for Remote Teaching. 
well actually i'm not that confident in in um, delivering this topic but hopefully this can help you to gain some insights for you to prepare uh, for us actually to prepare better for the the new academic year and before i start uh, i'd like to thank bu yusefa and bu Mita, my mentors for the feedback and encouragement okay let me start with the outline so this is the outline of uh, my talk hopefully i can finish them all in 15 minutes okay so the first one is our context when i was asked to deliver a presentation on this topic, I started by doing a very small survey to some of my friends and also my ex-students who are now working as teachers in different school levels in different parts of Indonesia. And these are the voices that I heard from them. So the first one is from Windy. Windy is a teacher at a National Plus Primary School in Jirebon. Don't worry, all the names are pseudonyms. I just try to avoid using Mawar, Melati, and Kumbang as the Nama Samaran. Yeah? So uh, Wendy said to me that from her observation, each of the teachers in her school has somehow implemented extensive reading, and they asked the students to go to the library. And children books and novels are mostly available in English. And another voice is from Lulu, who is a teacher at the private high school in BST. Uh, Lulu says that there are books and novels, poems, plays, biographies of international writers in English. And if your voices are represented by these two teachers, we can categorize yourself as fortunate teachers. But probably many of us, or probably the majority of us, do not belong to the previous category, but we belong to this other category, which is unfortunate teachers, like, for example, Banu. And he said that the teachers in his school, which is a public high school in Aceh, were having difficulties to provide students with, um, sorry, with resources that are interesting for the students. And another um, is from Riri, who actually reiterated what Banu has said, saying that the resources are very limited and she has to rely much on students' book. This is my translation for Buku Paket. And the last one is probably the most unfortunate teacher or probably the most miserable situation. It's from Kathy. She is teaching at a private high school in Bogor and her school doesn't even have a library. So, okay, actually, um, Kathy's school has a library, but they have to share it with the uh, junior high school. So the library belongs to the junior high school. Well, actually, when we talk about access, access is, of course, inevitably one of in the important keys in reading literacy or in literacy development. So this is pointed out by Fuad Hassan in 2013, availability of resources and supporting facilities, and also by Miller and McKenna, who, uh, points out, who point out that access is one of these four important dimensions when we talk about literacy development. But what about our current situation in Indonesia? Yeah, this is our situation in Indonesia. And this is taken from one of the studies done by Kementerian Pendidikan and Kebudayaan. It's in 2019. And you can see that the reading literacy activity index is low. It's only 37 0.32%. And among the dimensions that make up the, the index, you can see that access is the lowest. It's only 23.09, and that is very low. So this is the struggle that we faced before the pandemic, and will still probably the struggle that we face after the pandemic ends. But what about now? Yeah, I think every one of us is aware that as of uh, March, we've been asked to teach the students remotely. So we have to teach from our homes and students have to learn uh, remotely from their homes. So let's see later how uh, this type of teaching uh, can actually affect the kind of reading resources that we can uh, provide for our students. Okay, but before uh, we move on to the uh, reading resources, I'd like to define 
remote teaching or emergency remote teaching by quoting Hoches et al. 2020. So it's actually a temporary shift. I underline this temporary shift of instructional delivery to an alternate delivery mode due to crisis circumstances. Uh, so this, uh, this term is coined to highlight the difference between what we are doing now during this pandemic and high quality uh, online teaching. Of course, there are some shifts that we have to deal with with regards to our current uh, mode of teaching. The first one is pedagogy. The way we uh, teach the students is different. The way we interact with them is different. The design, um, the all, all of the uh, lessons, uh, like uh, evaluation factors, assessment, all of them are different. And another one is the technology. We no longer use markers. We no longer use whiteboards. So uh, there are some uh, changes or shifts. And what I would like to deliver today is how actually the reading resources also change and when with regards to uh, remote teaching I would like to highlight these two uh, important aspects accessibility and affordability more seriously these two aspects may be um, the considerations even before the pandemic when we have face-to-face -face. but uh, in this kind of situation uh, Accessibility, of course, matters because we cannot ask the students to go to the library. I think we are not allowed to do that. It's prohibited. Uh, even uh, to the school library or public library, they cannot get a book from the library. And another one is affordability because um, this pandemic has actually, sorry, this pandemic has actually uh, affected a lot of factors in or dimension or aspects in our life, including financial situation. So uh, I would suggest this one in facing our current situation and in uh, helping teachers us to teach remotely. This is a funny quote. I'll actually, I need to somehow hide a tab uh, here on my screen. There's a tab I, I need to move it first so I can see the quote clearly. Sorry about this. So the internet is the world's largest library. It's just that all the books are on the floor. This is very funny quote, but it's so true. It's from John Allen Paldo. So he's a professor in mathematics. Uh, given that access to the internet and devices like laptop or cell phones are available, then I would argue that in this particular moment, we can rely much on digital resources, but which resources are to pick for the students? This is our big question. Thanks to some, um, wait, okay. Thanks to some foundations and publishers who have made the resources available for free. So, of course, the first one that you can go to is the ER Foundation. Uh, they have some collections of books that you can access and students can access uh, freely for free. They don't have to pay. And this is one of the examples. It is actually a comic. So I think you, uh, your students, our students will find it interesting. And probably we noticed that in the beginning of the pandemic, some publishers started to make the, the resources available for free, uh, especially for educators and parents. And one of the publishers was a scholastic publisher. I am not sure if they still make all the resources available. I think they have already restricted some of the resources, but still there are uh, resources, free resources that you can use and employ for, your, uh, for our class later. Okay, and this is another what's it, website, useful website that I think teachers will find very resourceful. This is uh, readworks.org. So you just have to sign up as teachers and then you can uh, explore all the, uh, what's that, the uh, resources there, the collections. And what is fascinating is that all the, the books are graded. So you can see on the right side, yeah, so there are a number of words, uh, 
textile level and the type of book book so students can pick the one that is right or suitable from themselves and what is a uh, very useful uh, and resourceful about this website is that you can see on uh, on the right top sorry i didn't mean to click that so here if you click on assign and then you can assign a particular text or books to your google classroom uh, i think many of us use google classroom as our learning management system when we have to teach our students remotely so this is going to be very uh, resourceful for us Okay, if you're dealing with news items, these are some of the websites that you can revert to. Uh, Pak Rob, Thomas Rob last week already mentioned, and I think Ifani uh, Pai also uh, repeated that one, the VOA Learning English and BBC Learning English. You can also go to Breaking News English. Uh, what I like about this website is that they have six different levels of uh, text so students can choose the one or we can pick the one that is suitable for our students not too hard not too easy all right in addition to the previously mentioned um, websites i would suggest that uh, we as teachers can also install some useful apps this is one of the examples epic it's called epic so um as educators, you can register yourself for free, but I don't think that they will provide a complete collection like this. So I sign up as parents. And uh, if you sign up as parents, then your first month will be free, but then the subsequent months you'll be, we will be in charge around 100,000 rupees. So uh, I think it's worth uh, buying or subscribing because uh, you can, find a lot of interesting resources for stu uh, students of different ages. Buela, if you can wrap up the presentation. Okay, oh my God, all right. Okay, sorry, but yeah, I will back. So these three are um, some other useful apps that you can also uh, utilize later. Rivet, uh, Wattpad, students love Wattpad and folks rivet and folks are audiobooks uh, what pet i think it's more suitable for um, adult learners or more independent readers okay so uh, i will be very quick in discussing selecting appropriate materials but if i if i already uh, talk about it so the rule is pick the students have to know why they are reading the book uh, the book has to be interesting for them they can comprehend um, the book and they know the words. If the on one page they find uh, more than what five difficult words, so it's not the book, uh, it's not the right book for them. Ask them to put it back in the bookshelf or change to another book. Okay, so this is going to be uh, my some of my uh, some of su uh, suggestion that I uh, would like to uh, give. So we as a teacher we can also be a librarian for our students, especially during this uh, difficult time. So we can create a catalog on our Google Drive or our, our cloud storage, any, it can be Dropbox, it can be uh, OneDrive. And inside the folder, we can make some subfolders which show the types of books or texts, fiction, nonfiction, comic. And um, I agree with Parifai that we have to think about the representation of culture yeah, in the uh, varieties of books that we choose. And then if we can, we can level the resources based on certain categories, based on the difficulty levels, number of words or exile words. Uh, we can then share the link to the students. So students have their own library. Yeah. So it's easy for them to select or to browse and to get the resource. Okay. Okay. And create a spreadsheet where students can report the titles they have picked and finished reading. Uh, because my time is limited, so I will just show this one. There are some um, follow-up activities that you can do later. And uh, the three-round conversation was explained by Bu truly last week. So this is my uh, concluding remark. I grew up watching Dora, Boot, and Map. And somehow as teachers, we have to learn from Dora. We have to be the explorer because the courage to explore will open up immeasurable possibilities. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, that's my email address and my Instagram.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Bu Ella. There's so many new insights, yeah, about our resource for remote teaching. And Bapak Ibu, now we are moving to the panelist talk. We have three panelists today. The first one is Ibu Chris Asanti. The second one is Ibu Mega Wulandari. And the third one is Pak Mahbudin. Let me introduce the first panelist. Ibu Chris Asanti will talk about uh, children's literature as reading resources for elementary school. And she is a lecturer in cultural science faculty, Mulawarman University. Ibu Chris Asanti, if you could join us now, that would be yes. great. The yes, book. I'm uh, here already, Pak Firman. Okay, Ibu, you have 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I will start sharing my screen now. Uh, okay, I'm a little bit nervous because the previous presentations were great and very insightful. Well, anyway, uh, I would like to make sure that everyone can see my uh, screen. Can you, Pak Firman, I will, I will ask. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Well, anyway, um, uh, my name is Chris Asanti and then I'm from uh, Samarinda, East Kalimantan. Uh, I teach in Mulawarma University and then to make it succinct, I will directly go to my presentation. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Children's Literature as Reading Resources for Elementary School Teachers. Well, um, my talk will... Okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, uh, I, will, I will talk about... The first one is about what is children literature and then the second one I will talk about why children literature and then the third one is teacher's roles and then some of the possible activities that you can use uh, to teach uh, young learners or children. Well, I will directly go to my, uh, before I go to my first uh, point of my presentation, I would like to remind you some of the principles in extensive reading, but then today I will um, only focus on the first and the second, the fifth and the 10th. That the first one is the reading material should be easy. And then you should also uh, explore the wide variety of topics. And then the fifth one is that the purpose uh, uh, should be about pleasure. And then you give information and general understanding to your students. And then the 10th one is that you should be a role model because I think that the 10th one is the most important thing. Okay, I will go directly to the first one. Uh, as we know that there are so many definitions of children literature and then there is no one fixed meaning of what children literature is. But then uh, talking about children literature, uh, I would like to um, pinpoint some of the important uh, ideas about what children liter children's literature is. The first one is that uh, when we are talking about children literature, uh, actually, I do agree with what Huck, Hepler and uh, Hickman and Kiefer said about that. Uh, they underlined on uh, it was made for enjoyment. So I think uh, enjoyment is one of the keywords of children's literature. And then another or other definitions of that, of children's literature is that uh, it should be, uh, it should entertain the children and inform them. And then they should be able to explore and understand so that it can enrich their lives and widen their hor horizons. And then another idea about children literature is that about uh, the imagination. And then the last one is uh, another uh, key word for children's literature is that pleasure rather than for dictatic uh, purposes. So I will only, uh, I, I use those keywords to actually convince me that it's okay to use children's literature uh, in extensive reading with young learners. Okay, I will go to my next uh, slide. Uh, why children's literature? Just like what I told you before that it is usually, uh, uh, it is usually compact uh, and then that the language is very simple, and then the text length is uh, bearable, and that usually it is also motivating and interesting for the readers, for us as teachers or parents. So that's why um, I propose children's literature. If you want to 
uh, uh, if you want to motivate your the young learners to read with you. And then some of the other reasons uh, uh, it is easy to understand. And then usually when we are talking about children's literature, uh, it contains a large numbers of illustrations which uh, uh, are usually helpful for the teachers or the parents to actually also give uh, comprehension to the children or to the young uh, learners. And then usually the words are rhyming and repetitive. So it will be very easier for the uh, children to remember some of the words because the words are usually repeated and then talking about the talking about the book uh, it can be discussed over and over again and this one is from me and then I take it based on my uh, experience after two years of doing uh, reading aloud with uh, some children in a small village in Samarinda. Now I would like to uh, emphasize some of the teachers roles here as the teacher uh, you should be a role model for your uh, students. And then you have to determine your goals. Uh, what is or what are the purposes of you doing the readings to your students? And then if the stories are too difficult, uh, it's better for you while you are reading to simplify the story. Because usually if the story is too difficult and then if there are too many texts, then it will be difficult for the children to grasp the ideas and then to have fun with them. And then uh, the fourth one is make sure that the, uh, the children's backgrounds, the children that I, um, that I usually read with, uh, they are from uh, different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. And then some of them, just like what Ella said previously, that they are not fortunate in a way that the schools that they uh, study uh, they don't have uh, libraries or even if there are libraries, usually the books are not interesting for them. And then another role for the teachers or the parents, you should create fun and engaging activities. And then here are some of the activities that I propose uh, to you. I still remember what pa Rob uh, said in the previous presentation uh, last week, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then it is. it was also repeated by Irfan in his presentation previously that uh, when we are talking about the books, we usually think about graded, reader, graded readers, but then um, we know, we do understand that our context in Indonesia is quite uh, different with the other countries which are more fortunate. So that's why it's okay for the teachers to actually use uh, Indonesian books, Indonesian children's book, because, uh, or maybe you can provide them with folklores or legends or, um, uh, and then uh, also some local stories. And then if you want to start introducing them with English language, that's okay as well. But then don't forget that reading, uh, remember that it takes a village. So if the library uh, where the, children, uh, the libraries are not equipped with uh, interesting books, you can ask your colleagues, you can go to your boss, and then uh, you can also go to your to the public libraries in your place, so that it will be very helpful for you because usually when we, when we also involve other people, then um, the references will be also rich. And then uh, here is the activities that I, uh, do with my uh, children uh, for the pre-reading, make sure that you create a comfortable atmosphere for them. And for the uh, elementary school teachers, maybe you can take them outside of the class and then uh, you can take them to the uh, football field or just in front of the class or somewhere near their school. And then, uh, and because doing extensive reading is a little bit impossible for you who are from a not really fortunate school, maybe you can just bring a stack of book and then uh, ask one of the children to choose the book which might interest them. And by doing this, you give them freedom. Uh, you give them choices. And just like what Corey said previously that more choice leads to better choices. And I do believe in that. And then while reading, you, might, uh, you may involve the children to predict the story from the book cover and the illustrations. You can do this by adopt uh, the idea from 
Ibu Maria Theodora Ping with uh, dialogic reading activities. Uh, you can do um, you can do the activities with the children. You can ask them some questions about the books based on the cover, based on the illustrations in the book. And then uh, if you're uh, reading um, an English book, maybe uh, it's better for you to ask the children uh, to repeat the words, some new words. And then you can also spell together the words. And then after that, you write them on the board or maybe you spell them for the children. Uh, five new vocabulary or five new words will be enough for them as long as you just remember to set the goals, the purposes of why you are reading for them. And then uh, this one is actually uh, the activities that I, that, I, uh, that I did with the children after they read uh, The Day the Crayon Squid. The book was very interesting for the children even when they uh, only did coloring. And then I, I gave them freedom because the, stories, uh, the story was about uh, a stack of crayons. And then they wrote letters uh, to the owners. They said to the owners that uh, I didn't, uh, for example, a blue crayon, he said to the owner that I didn't want to color uh, sea and sky anymore. That's why I give uh, the children freedom to paint the animals uh, based on the colors that they like. That's why uh, one of the children, uh, her name uh, is Sela. She said that I like blue color and then I would like to use blue color for my elephant. And then I said, yes, that's okay for you to use blue color for your elephant. And then this one is another activity that we did uh, do, uh, during Ramadan. And then I asked them to make a uh, kartu lebaran and then uh, they just uh, swept the cards with their uh, friends at that time. And then the story that we read at that time was um, Putri Keong. Uh, it was a folk tale from Indonesia. So don't worry if Bapak and Ibu, you don't have enough uh, children book or English books in the library. You can use any resource as long as you understand about the goals, as long as uh, you engage the children by creating fun activities and doing book talk with them. And then I think that's all. Yes, this is my, my last presentation. I have already uh, okay. done. Uh, thank you so much, Baba and Ibu. Thank you. And so have much. a great evening. Thank you, Bu, Bu Asanti, for sharing. I think that was a relevant topic, which I'm sure may have already answered some of the questions raised by our participants today in the chat rooms. Well, we are moving to the next panelist, Ibu Mega Wulandari M. Hum. Uh, she will talk about promoting the love of reading through technology. Ibu Mega is a faculty member of the English Language Education Study Program at Sanata Dharma University. And she obtained both her bachelor's and master's degree from English Department of Sanata Dharma University. And her research interests include technology, uh, language teaching media, contextual learning, material design, and she recently published a book co-authored by Ibu Truly Almandu entitled Technology for English Language Learnings. Ibu Mega Ulandari, the floor is yours. You have uh, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Firman. So I would like to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen clearly, Pak Firman? Uh, yes, if you could uh, make it, yes, there, there you go. All right. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, the previous speakers have shared with us a very wonderful insight on ER, okay? And uh, the title of my talk today is Promoting the Law for Reading Through Technology, okay? Uh, I think this information that I'd like to share would be useful and also relevant with today's condition, um, especially for teachers who are now preparing for online learning in the upcoming semester because of the pandemic. So um, let's start my presentation. So I would like to introduce myself first. My name is Mega. I'm a teacher by day and a storyteller by night. And it's because it's almost night. So I'm gonna tell you two stories about me as a mom-to-be and also as a teacher. So now at the moment, I'm expecting for eight months. So uh, as many other moms, I want to uh, raise kids who is an avid reader. So I'm really lucky to, to be with this webinar because 
uh, I got a lot of information about how to build love for reading for kids. And then I came across a podcast initiated by Bu Uke and also Bu Yusefa called Saturday With, featuring Bumita and also Bu Truli. And after listening to that episode, I realized that the, the love for reading should start from family. So as many other moms, I was in, interested to invest on buying some books for my kids. So I was so happy to get the information about the biggest book fair in Indonesia, which offers so many discounts. It's called Big Bad Wolf. Maybe some of you are familiar with this uh, book fair. I heard that Bu Martini from SMA Sedayu also uh, bought some books for ER activities on her school from this book fair. So I started to invest on books and a few days later, the books were delivered safely to my house. And um, it's really nice to have this experience for my baby because uh, Delicis says in 2020s, says that the benefits of reading to unborn baby are not only the relaxation and bonding the mother feel, but science shows that reading to baby in the womb helps develop early language learning. So I want to start very early to have, what is it, to cultivate the love for reading for my kid. I know that it's good for my baby once, uh, I know that it is good for my baby once he or she is born to contact with physical books, okay? But for now, it took me less than five minutes to read the whole books because uh, the books only, only provide very short sentences in one page. So it took me only less than five minutes to read the whole books that I bought from uh, BBW. So I was craving for more books to read while waiting for the baby to be born. Then, I probably have a problem with, that most of us have, which is limited funding. So I imagine that it would be nice if there is an app which can help me choose the book as easy as I choose music on Spotify. Mm -hmm. So I explore my phone, then I find this application already installed in my phone, Google Play Books. Maybe, uh, some of you who use Android phone also have this application on your phone. And then, so I download and explore the, explore the apps and I found out that there are lots of free kids book that I can download in these apps. So now I can read the book every day, at least one book, uh, every day for my kids. And I will show you how to use this application. First, what you need to do is open the app, then type free kids books. Okay. So open the app and type free kids book. It will provide you information about wide range of books you can Lot for free. Choose the one that you want to read. So the access is very easy and it's synchronized with your other devices too. So if you finish with one, you can choose another book like this one. I also found some useful features, especially for language learners. So for example, if you stumbled upon unfamiliar words, you can look it up by pressing the word a little bit longer, then it will show you the definition of trend or translation of the words. Or you can also highlight the important parts of the book. Yeah. And then we can also store all of your collection in its digital library. It's handy and light, so it's easy to carry around. It's like bringing a hundred books on your pocket. Okay, so I believe that this application is not only useful for me as a mom, but also for me as a teacher. So I got an idea to use Google Play Books for extensive reading activities in class. So uh, I named this activity Spin and Retail. First, 
assign the students to choose a book on Google Playbooks, and then provide some question on a spinning wheel generated by using word wall. Maybe you have already familiar with a book dice that Bumita has already introduced you. And, but uh, the dice is actually the physical thing. Now, we, if we want to make it into virtual, we can use the spinning wheel generated using word wall. Later, I will show you how it looks. And then the third one, have a virtual meeting using Google Meet and spin the wheel and ask them to retell the story they have read to their friends. So it will look like this. So you have the questions in the spinning wheel and then you play it. Like what was your favorite part of the story? And then after that, you have the virtual meeting and then ask the students to uh, retell the story from the book they have read. So I think it's very relevant with today's condition where it is uh, impossible for students to come to the school and choose book in the library. So it can be an alternative. And then move on to the second story. So I teach in English education study program. And in this study program, students are trained to be dynamic and forward-thinking prospective English teachers. So they, they will become teachers once uh, they graduate from this university. So um, I try to motivate them to collaborate with each other. Uh, maybe it's, it's like the implementation of Buella's idea about having a catalog in form of Google Drive. So I have done it with my students. So the first one they need to do is to put the students in group of two or three, and then ask them to choose a reading passage. And then after that, create some activities based on the reading passage and design a worksheet with Canva. So at that time, I make it as a movement, as a social movement. Um, after they have already designed their worksheets, they put all the worksheet, all the works into a Google Drive. And then we sort them out based on the level. After that, we share the link to public. So you can access it here actually bit.ly slash TST movement 2020. So there are some worksheets that are uh, available to be used, okay, for your um, reading activities in your school. This is one of the example. And then we made a poster and posted on social media. We named the movement as teachers support teachers. Teachers, and then we support teachers, parents, or English learners who are affected by COVID-19 with ready to use worksheets for reading, for reading and vocabulary practice. And then uh, after the poster is circulating, we got some comments. Uh, one of them is from Miss Lola, okay. Uh, she says that this project is really helpful for, for teachers and also students who are now affected by COVID-19, so they cannot go to school. So this project can be an alternative for them to have reading practice. We'll make and then this, yes, okay. Right. Okay, so this is the last slide actually, Pak Firman. So the message that I want to deliver from this project is that the most valuable resource that all teachers have is each other. So without collaboration, our growth is limited to our own perspective. So Bapak Ibu, let's support each other. Yeah, I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a nice stopping point right there. The technology is very useful, yeah, especially in the time of pandemic like right now. So thank you again, Bu Mega. And Bapak Ibu, last but not least, we have Pak Mahmudin MPD as the panelist. And he will talk about choosing reading resources for school literacy movement, use the available resources or make them available. And Pak Mahmudin is a teacher librarian at MTSN Satu Pandeglang, Banten. And he has been actively involved in literacy movement projects in his area. Pak Mahmudin, are you here already? Hello, yes. Okay, I'm, you have I'm, 10 minutes, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. And 
this is my honor to be here. Thank you very much. And let me share my PPT first. Firman, can you see my, my presentations? Yes. Fine. Okay. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I'm Agudin. I'm a teacher librarian at MSN1 Paniglang, Banten. Uh, this is my honor to be here. And thank you very much for all the speakers for the great presentation and also for all the panelists. I have a very good uh, they have presented very good uh, presentation. And I have a very simple uh, presentation to share here. Uh, I'm a teacher librarian. It means I'm a teacher and also a librarian. Uh, I teach English at my school. I also manage library. And I have official certificate issued by the National Library of Indonesia as a librarian. And today's topic, my, my topic is choosing reading resources for school for school literacy movement. Use the available resources or make them available. Because I'm the librarian, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, school literacy related to uh, literacy in my school. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, reading Indonesia movement and also using available reading resources and uh, make reading resources available. Uh, let's start from a reading Indonesia movement. As we know that uh, Indonesia has uh, still, Indonesia have a lack of reading interest and our government is struggling to, uh, to, to build a reading culture in Indonesia. And that's why in uh, 2016, Indonesia has established a Reading Indonesia Movement. Uh, reading Indonesia Movement is the effort to awake and build reading culture. It involves literacy activists, non-government organizations, community organizations, religious organizations, youth organizations, professional organizations, early educational unit, and non-formal education unit, reading center, and partner of education office. The general purpose of a reading Indonesia movement is actually to build people love to read, to be lifelong learners, so they will be able to improve their quality of life. Um, and from reading Indonesia movement, actually there are three kinds of uh, parts of reading Indonesia movement. Uh, GLS, uh, School Literacy Movement, Gerakan Literasi Sekolah, and GLK, Family Literacy Movement, and the third one is uh, GLM, Community Literacy Movement. Uh, Indonesia is struggling to support reading culture in, in Indonesia from three sides, from family, school, and also community. Okay, and as we know that this is the result, we Indonesia still in the, uh, in the lowest ranks of based on PISA result about reading in 2017 and our government uh, is pursuing the better result of PISA in 2021. I hope with the support of IERA uh, to support reading culture in Indonesia, we, I hope we will have a better result in 2021 in PISA result. And let's start uh, choosing available resources. School must make a good effort to make uh, uh, reading resources, good reading resources for the students because it is very important. And actually, uh, especially libraries must provide students with good books so they will be, they will love reading by, if they find good book, they will read books. And, okay, this one, actually, uh, how to get reading resources. A school actually can make effort from 
uh, from cooperation with the uh, other institution, for example, from the National Library, for example. And this is my school. And I would like to thank you very much to IERA, uh, especially Ibu Yusefa, for his kindness to uh, support our literacy movement in our school. Uh, I have, uh, IERA have, have been, have supported us twice for, for reading resources in 2000 and last year, okay. Uh, I thank you, uh, Iera, especially Bu Yusefa, Bu Anita, and Bu Oke, and other members. Thank you very much for this. My students love this very much. Uh, although we need to uh, make good efforts to, uh, to understand this book, actually. Okay, so this is uh, the available resources. And also, our, our government has provided uh, uh, resources online from Gerakan GLS, uh, School Literacy Movement like this, and GLK, this one, and GLM, with the uh, reading resources. Of course, it's to, to support reading resources. This one is uh, the module or reading resources provided in School Literacy Movement. Uh, let's see the example here. Okay. Okay. Uh, these are books provided in uh, school literacy movement. There are almost 500 books, uh, free book that everyone can download. And these books is to, to make uh, reading culture. And this one is an uh, example of, uh, this one is an uh, example of books provided uh, by our government for school literacy movement. This is very good book, I guess. And uh, that one is uh, family literacy movement. These books, uh, they are actually not very uh, many books here, but it is a good start, I guess. Uh, our families can start uh, read resources from uh, family reading culture. And also, we have resources from this. This is kind of books for our kids, family literacy movement. And the third one is for society, community literacy movement. There are some uh, good books to support community to build reading culture. Okay, and this one, uh, that is the available resources and how to make our uh, reading resources available. This is very important that uh, one of the uh, drawbacks or weakness is uh, limited funding to support reading resources. And let's see, this is based on the regulations uh, number 43, uh, year 2007 about library, uh, schools must save at least 5% of each uh, school operational assistance program to support literacy for uh, library. And, but uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of school, lots of school have not saved a proportional budget to support literacy in their school. Uh, actually, based on these regulations, uh, every school must save a budget at least 5% to support reading in their school. And this one, at least 20% of 5%, 20% uh, for textbook and 5% for uh, reference book or to support reading literacy. Uh, let's, uh, because uh, this is a uh, amount of school or personal assistance program 2020, that every students in Indonesia for elementary student, they will receive at every school 900,000 rupiah per student per year, and junior high school will receive 1 million, 1.1 million uh, 
rupiah per student per year and and for the senior high school will receive one and five hundred million rupiah per students per year and this is five percent of from this budget must be delivered to support uh, literacy in the school to support library and let's see let's Sorry. make a if you could finish the presentation very soon, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one, and this one, let's say the, this is a very simple cal calculation. So this one, uh, it means every school, for number school that has 500, 500 students, for example, they will have 20,000, more than 20,000 million per year to support reading culture. And also for general health school, 27,000 to 27 million uh, rupiah to support uh, reading culture. I guess uh, my conclusion is that it is about priority. It is about actually every school have uh, enough funding for support reading literacy. Uh, and we as teacher have to ask this to the principal to make uh, reading resources available. That's it for my presentation. Thank, Thank you very you so much. much, Pak Mahmudin. So, Bapak Ibu, we are now at the end of the session, and we have heard the presentations from all the speakers and panelists. And I'm sure we have the full package of extensive reading for today, starting from a book and paper, literature, technology, literacy movement, and available resources that are we, that we can access online. And we have collected all the questions raised by the participants both in Zoom and in the YouTube. But unfortunately, because of the limit, limited time that we have now, uh, the questions will be answered uh, offline by the, by the speakers and the panelists. So we will collect the questions and send them to the speakers and panelists. And then we will share the answers uh, to you guys uh, later on. So I think that's all for today. And I'm so sorry that we don't have the questions and answer sessions in, uh, for today virtual talk. Uh, but don't worry, I'm sure your questions will be answered. So uh, I'm Furman. Thank you so much for your attentions and uh, cooperations for today. Uh, and I'm returning the floor to Ibu uh, Truly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pak Firman. I'm sure we gain invaluable insights from the presentation. Before we close this session, I'd like to share some information. The first one, the exit ticket link is on the screen. So please visit the page to get your e-certificate. Kindly note that the link will be available for only two hours starting from now. It's now 5.38, so it will be closed at 7.38 p.m. Western Indonesia time. The link for the PowerPoint materials is also on the screen. These links will also be posted on Telegram, chat room, and YouTube comment box. We'll be back next week on Saturday, the 18th of July, with another inspiring topic, What Can Literacy Do? It will be held at the same time, 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. Please don't forget to set your reminder. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before every, everyone leaves the meeting, as usual, let's have a very brief photo session at the end of the session. Shall we? Are you ready, Pak Thomas? Yes. So please uh, start your camera. Okay, are you ready, Bapak Ibu? I will count one, two, three. One, two, three. Next one. One, two, three. The next one. One, two, three. And the last one. One, two, three. Done. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pak Thomas. So this is the end of virtual talk number seven. See you next week on virtual talk number eight. Happy weekend, everybody.
Bye. Thank you, everybody. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all panelists. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, see you next week. See you next week.